And so, ruler of all, we thank you that you wrapped yourself in flesh and you made yourself our vision and that you inhabit us as our vision. And Lord, I thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. And that's not just some kind of poetic metaphorical statement. That's an ontological statement. So inhabit us this morning and inhabit this message for your purposes, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's great to see you this Labor Day weekend, end of summer. I hate the end of summer, but I have to cough right now because I had almonds, okay? Just a second. <sighs> Hopefully my voice will work now. Um, in October, like I told you, we'll begin preaching through 1 Peter. But this weekend and next weekend, I'd like to talk about two stories from the book of Acts that have to do with the spread of the, the gospel. And you know, the word gospel means good news, and gospel is also a genre of music. Isn't that, isn't that kind of interesting? In Acts 9, Jesus calls Paul into his service in a rather unorthodox manner. He blinds him with light on the road to Damascus. In Acts 9.15, Jesus reveals to Ananias that Paul is, quote, a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. In Acts 13.2, through the believers in Antioch, the Spirit of Jesus sends out Paul and Barnabas, quote, for the work to which I have called them. I believe that God has work to which he has called you. And he has work to which he has called us, the sanctuary, which in fact is printed on the front of your bulletin, your e-news, s-news. In Acts 13 through 14, Paul and Barnabas undertake their first missionary journey traveling through Asia Minor. That's the, the blue and the yellow lines on that little map up there. In Acts 15, Paul goes to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council to meet with Peter, James, and the other disciples to decide how best to minister to and serve all the Gentile believers, new Gentile believers. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas set out on Paul's second missionary journey with the intent of visiting the churches that Paul and Barnabas had founded throughout Asia Minor. Their outbound path is represented by the purple line on the map. This is Acts 16, verse 6. <clears throat> and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Isn't that an interesting sentence? Like sometimes God just is like, I just want you to shut up right now. Anyway. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. That was fascinating. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we, and we now as Paul and Silas and Timothy and also Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, we sought to go on, to Macedon on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. It's fascinating how, Paul, how God directs Paul and others in, in the New Testament and in the book of Acts. Sometimes visions, a dream, a word of knowledge. Sometimes it's circumstances. Sometimes it's a church meeting. And what seems best and most reasonable to all. In the letter to the Gentile churches from the Jerusalem Council, I love this, the apostles write, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you. I love that. It seemed good to us. See, they're, they're really not very different than us, are they? But in Acts 16, 9, Paul has a vision. And Paul and Silas and others, they conclude that God is calling them to take the gospel to Macedonia. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, thanks, Mike. That doesn't mean a whole lot uh, to us. <clears throat> mm. But to a geographer, that means Europe. And to a biblical historian, it means the heart of an ancient evil empire. 
Philippi, a leading city of Macedonia, had been founded by King Philip, Philip of Macedon in 356 BC, um, the same year that his son and heir Alexander uh, was born, or as we refer to him, Alexander the Great, that the Jews didn't always think was so great. He's the reason that the New Testament is written in Greek and not Hebrew. In 332 BC, the Jews surrendered to Alexander, who apparently did have a remarkable respect for the Jews, but those that followed him did not. So about 180 years later, after Alexander, the Greek king Antiochus IV Epiphanes outlawed Judaism, persecuted the Jews, and was portrayed as the abomination of desolation, or the one who set up the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, the prototypical antichrist. I'm just saying that this vision is a big deal and quite an assignment for Paul and, and these guys. You, you may not have such a specific vision, but Jesus does tell his disciples, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Paul writes that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and temperance. In Colossians, he writes, in the whole world, the gospel, the good news, the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing. The gospel is bearing fruit. In fact, Scripture claims that we are a kind of first fruits. Like uh, the harvest of the earth, the first fruits of the harvest of the earth. Jesus said to the eleven that he had chosen, Going, therefore, because all authority in heaven and on earth has been already given unto me, going, therefore, disciple, not make disciples, that's the way it sometimes gets translated, but literally, going, therefore, knowing this, that I've conquered, disciple all nations, baptizing, teaching. See, a disciple isn't simply a convert. That's something that we can maybe do through all sorts of means. A disciple is someone made by Jesus through the power of his word. The word that we're called to speak into other people's hearts, kind of like a farmer plants a seed in broken and dirty soil. Seed that grows and bears fruit, which is also more seed. So Paul had a vision. And God gives us visions. When I went to Fuller in the 1980s, this is kind of the center, the epicenter of the church growth movement. Everyone was talking about vision, strategy, and goals. Strategy is your plan to achieve the vision, and your goals are your means of measuring success. I think I was pretty good at vision statements and mapping out strategy for a time. That is organizational structures, classes, ministries, programs. My church grew like crazy for 15 years Exceeding all go goals, all goals. And then for about 15 years, it did not. It was about 15 years ago that a friend paid for me to come to his conference on successful church leadership. He had something like the 10 keys for the successful church leader. And after learning the keys, we were supposed to grade ourselves, you know, and then share with our discussion group. I shared that the year before I had an A in like every category. And now I just seem to be like a steady F all the way, all the way through. And then I don't think I said it, but I thought it. I thought, you know, according to these 10 keys, Jesus also got an F. In fact, he was so bad they crucified him. Now, I don't want to justify my failures, but it's just weird how everything gets turned upside down in the presence of Jesus and his tree on the holy mountain. Verse 11, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Now, that's a pretty good strategy. They figured that on the Sabbath, they'd find some Jews or Gentile God-fearers down by the river, and they do. 
One of them is named Lydia. She believes is baptized along with her whole household. She invites Paul and his friends to stay with her, and they do. But ironically, she's not a man from Macedonia. She's from Thyatira in Asia, where Paul was forbidden to speak the word. Whatever the case, things seem to go really well down by the river. Verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer down by the river, I guess they've been going back and forth, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. Python in Greek, or Puthon. From Puthon, the location of Delphi, and the Pythian oracle, a spirit of Python, and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. That's, you know, prophecy and divination. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. There are some that tell lies in such a way that people think they are telling the truth, wrote Soren Kierkegaard. But far more dangerous are those that tell the truth in such a way that people think they are telling lies. The slave girl has a demonic spirit. Like the spirit in the oracle at, at Delphi. If you've never witnessed such a thing, this is kind of, I know, hard to believe. But there are sentient, intelligent realities other than people. These spirits are not all-knowing, but they may know things that you don't know, like the location of a foreign and invading army. So it was common in Greece to seek advice from someone like this slave girl. Apparently, she made her owners quite a bit of money. She was an important part of the local economy. This Pythian spirit in her speaks the truth about Paul, but is not in submission to the truth that is Jesus. And sometimes, this surprised me to discover, sometimes demons are just stupid. Like people are stupid. But Paul is not out hunting demons. And he obviously doesn't want to get tangled up in trouble with the local authorities and the economy and all this stuff. But she just doesn't stop. Verse 18, and this she kept doing for many days. Isn't that something? Following him around for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed. I love that word annoyed. Demons are annoying. They constantly distract. You've all dealt with them even if you don't know what you're doing. He's annoyed. This interruption is not part of his strategy. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very, very hour. Apparently, it took a little while that very hour. It came out of her that very hour, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, now he's messing with them. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace, the, the agora, before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. They're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely, that is, securely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Archaeologists think that this is that actual prison in um, Philippi. This is the outer chamber or perhaps chambers of the prison. This is the innermost chamber where they would have put the worst criminals, often sentenced to, to death, to, to die. Paul and Silas would have been placed here in the dark, bleeding profusely, having been beaten with rods, and their feet fastened in stalks. Stalks that were used in that day to torture people. Welcome to Europe. How's that evangelism strategy working for you, Paul? Hey, um, didn't you have a vision? Maybe God didn't give you that vision. Or maybe you're too stupid to interpret the vision. Maybe God is just, you know, making you pay for being such an arrogant 
ass. You are desolate. I imagine that's what the demons were whispering to Paul and Silas in the dark and the pain and the shame and the confusion. So what are they to do now? Verse 25, about midnight, <laughs> Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Praying is this Greek verb, prasukomai. It means to ask God for stuff. And that would make sense, right? But why are they singing hymns to God? Hymneo is the verb. It means to praise something with a song. They were worshiping. It's what we do all the time. We praise football teams, political leaders, automobiles, superheroes, restaurants. We praise them when they work for us. But God doesn't seem to be working for Paul and Silas. They were singing praise songs to God, not about God to other people, but to God. As if they just loved him for who he is and enjoyed him because he is. You know, sometimes you find joy at rock bottom. When everything in your life has been stripped away, it exposes rock bottom. And you realize rock bottom is Jesus, the rock. And he's with you. Some of you have had that experience. I think once I had that experience and I couldn't stop hymneo. I just literally couldn't stop praising. Chuck Colson used to tell about visiting a prison in Brazil where all the inmates were just unusually happy and he wondered why. One of the inmates showed him. He, he led him down a corridor to the innermost cell Inside that cell, Colson had expected to find the very worst of all prisoners, but instead he found a crucifix carved by all the inmates. Beautiful, ornate crucifix. He's doing time for the rest of us, whispered the guide. Richard Wormbram, read tons of Richard Wormbram before he went to Romania. He was beaten and imprisoned in Romanian prison cells for decades. He writes, I dance for joy every night. Sometimes I was so filled with joy, I felt that I would burst if I didn't give it expression. I remembered these words, blessed are you when men come to hate you, when they exclude you from their company and reproach you and cast you out, cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. When everything is shaken, we discover what cannot be shaken. When everything we've done is stripped away, we come to see what God has done and what God is doing. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Hebrews 12, and thus let us offer acceptable worship with reverence and awe. I mean, maybe Paul and Silas found joy at rock bottom where he found them. I mean, maybe he was finding them all along. Maybe he found them and then they went looking for more because it's addictive joy. It's fascinating how singing can do that sometimes, right? When you just let yourself or make yourself either way. To, to sing, you have to surrender to something that you recognize as beautiful, but you yourself cannot comprehend. Music is not illogical. <laughs> Music is ultra-logical. It's the mathematical harmonization of countless sound waves in the atmosphere all around you. To sing, you have to lose yourself to a logic greater than you yourself, that you yourself can comprehend, to a logic that surrounds you and envelops you as music. You must lose your insular little self, the silent little prison that is yourself, and then find yourself Singing along. In Scripture, rock bottom, that is what cannot be shaken, the foundation of all things. Rock bottom is a song. The Logos, the reason, the Word of God who, who became flesh and dwelt among us. When we worship, we harmonize with the Creator, the unmoved mover. I am that I am. 
So years later to the Philippians, in Philippians 4, Paul wrote this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let all men, all people know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand right there. We, we struggle with that rejoice in the Lord, always worship. So we try to picture a guy, you know, in a bathroom holding sheep, always saying, oh God, you're like really so awesome and great and, and stuff. Well, four verses later in Philippians 4, 8, Paul writes this. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just or right, just means right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or, or gracious, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You know, Jesus is not the sun, but he's the light from the sun, through the sun, in the sun. Jesus is not a, he's not a supermodel, guys. And yet he is. He's the beauty that you perceive in a supermodel. Jesus is not a new car. And yet he's the beauty and the logic in every gear and every well-crafted piece of mess, metal. So, so don't worship the car. But you can enjoy the car and worship Jesus for the car. And check this out. You don't have to own the car or the girl or the son. And yet Paul says that all things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God. I'm just saying that there are reasons to worship all around you all day long. But when you see that all that light, truth, beauty, and grace became a man who constantly chooses to be with you no matter where you are, including the pit of hell or locked in stocks in a prison, that, when you see that, that will make you worship. When we worship our silent little universe of self, suddenly begins to expand. When we worship, we call the light into the darkness. We call the truth into our lies. We call the reason into our chaos, the way into our confusion, the life into these bodies, these psyches of sin and death. When we worship, the prison that is our self becomes a womb, which gives birth to the new creation. Worship isn't just singing. It's surrendering to the rhythm of the song that animates all reality, the, the logos. According to Paul, all that you do is to be worship, kind of like, like a dance. They prayed, surrendering their empty vessels, and they sang hymns to God. When we were dating, Susan used to sing to me, I love you, a bushel and a peck, a bushel and a peck, and a hug around the neck, a hug around the neck, and a bushel and a peck. And then we got married. Once we've been married for a few years, she had a vision of children. And then she had a strategy. We have been married for four years, and the end of seminary was in sight when we decided to start trying. But after a year, there were no babies. And she had not reached her goal. And so she doubled down on strategy. I'm not complaining. In some years, it, in some ways, it was the best year of, of my life. But it was also the worst, for my bride would cry herself to sleep every night. And I know this is weird, but I began to feel a little bit used. And she had stopped singing to me. No lie, she'd say, oh, Peter, you're so attractive. I just, I just want you. And I'd say, well, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining but you never wanted me this often before. It kind of seems that what you want isn't me, but babies. In biblical parlance, fruit. We had a friend who didn't want to get pregnant, but accidentally got like thoroughly pregnant. And it just pushed Susan over the edge. She just got incredibly angry with God. In a way, she hated God for love of fruit. One day, as she was driving home from work, she just pulled the car over, broke down weeping. And there in the car, weeping, forgave God. Our friend, herself, she just let it all go. A little, a little later, with me at the corner of Burbank Boulevard and Van Nuys Boulevard, I remember she turned to me and she said, Peter, I give up. I'm not even going to try. 
And at that point, her only reason to make love to me was me. And she got pregnant. And then she got pregnant again. Then she got pregnant again. Then she got pregnant again. And then she sent me to the doctor. <laughs> now, don't shut down. Listen to me closely. But it often happens that way. I've other stories too. And it often does not happen that way. I said, don't shut down because some of you have utterly surrendered and didn't get pregnant. Or maybe lost a, a, a baby, lost a child, or you maybe never even had a partner. The Bible is full of stories of barren women trying to get pregnant and the terrible, wonderful irony that you cannot impregnate yourself. And all of that is a sacramental parable about something far greater than just biological fruit. Heather Ireland is an old friend who was part of our church support staff in the 90s, early 2000s. She used to say these cryptic things around the office, like, the Lord took my song, or now he's given me my song. And one day she explained to me, she said, Peter, years ago, I lay in a hospital bed in incredible pain. I was losing my second and last baby. I hurt so much that I just couldn't even pray. But Dan, that was her husband and my friend, she said, but Dan prayed. And all at once, all at once the room went silent. And all my pain was gone. I felt something like honey poured over my body from my head to my toes. And then I realized that I was watching myself from the top of the room and, and nothing, nothing, nothing seemed truly real. Nothing until I heard singing. Praises so beautiful, so real, as if they were the only thing that was truly real. And then suddenly, I realized it was all coming from me. And through, through, through me, Peter, I sang and I sang and I sang in that darkest of all places and I experienced sheer joy and peace and the ultimate communion, love. That's the fruit of the Spirit born of Heather, and a fountain of praise. Perhaps Paul and Silas heard Jesus, their husband, praying for them, singing to them, once their plans had been swept away. And then they found Jesus in all of heaven singing through them, even as them, as they sang to Jesus. That's what Paul would call, quote, the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. You know what his name is? Salvation. God is salvation. And then Heather shared this with me. Peter, a few years ago, the Lord took my song. I just felt no joy and I had no strength to worship any longer. One night I just broke. I mourned the fact that I'd never have children. I sat in the window and I just poured out my soul. Not knowing how to pray, I prayed the psalm. And in case you, you forgot, the Psalms are the songbook of ancient Israel. So through the Psalms, Heather sang that she could not sing. That she had no song. When Luke writes that Paul and Silas sang in prison, hymneo, there's a very good chance that he's referring to the Psalms and even what the Jews refer to as the Hallel, which means praise. That's Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. In the Gospels, just after Jesus serves communion and before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, they all hymneo, sing praise, which likely refers to Psalm 18, sung at the conclusion of the Passover feast. I shall not die, but I shall live. And five times it's repeated. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. You know, almost each and every psalm, when you read through them, they like start as this cry for help, and then they end in praise. So through the psalms, Heather sang that she had no song. She sang with Jesus, and then she heard his voice. Speaking into her soul, he said, the woman without children is the mother of of thousands. You know, he doesn't just say that to, to Heather. He says that to all of us, his bride, his Jerusalem. 
Prophetically, he said it to me on four separate occasions, which I recorded with the dates in, in my Bible next to these verses that in Hebrew are written out as a song. And Isaiah 54, 1. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring, your children, will possess the nations. Verse 5, for your maker is your husband. Verse 8, in overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. In Hebrew, your kinsman Redeemer. Isaiah 54, surprise, surprise, immediately follows Isaiah 53, and it's all one prophetic song. Isaiah 53 goes like this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. Out of the anguish, verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant make many to be accounted righteous. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. So then he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Next verse, sing, O barren one who did not bear. On the tree in the garden. On the sixth day of creation, God sings his song to us that we would sing his song back to him as praise and give birth to an entire new creation. He sings his song, God sings his song, but we can't hear Jesus, God is salvation, when we're trapped in Mises. <laughs> the illusion that I am my own salvation. Hopefully remember that on the cross at the sixth hour of the day, the sixth day of the week, at the edge of the seventh day of creation, Jesus sang. He sang the 22nd Psalm. It goes like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me mock me. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my, brother's, at my mother's breast. What a statement, as if God is the life in your mother's milk. Verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. Verse 29, before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall come and proclaim his righteousness, his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. It is finished. He has done it. Done what? Everything. That's anything. You are not what you have done, but you are what God has done and what he is doing. In the Philippian jail, Paul and Silas surrendered their visions, their strategies, their goals, and Jesus sang to them from inside of them, you are my vision. You are my strategy, and you are my goal. In the dungeon of the Philippian jail, singing, Paul and Silas were literally, and in every sense of the word, a vision of Jesus. A vision of Jesus who has descended into the depths of the earth singing and who sets the captives free. And in the Philippian jail, there was no band, no liturgy, no parking, childcare, adult education classes. There was no bread and wine. And yet Paul and Silas were the body and blood of Jesus buried in a tomb in the heart of enemy territory. In that place, Jesus sang to them and then they began to sing to Jesus. And the prison that was that Roman jail cell could not contain the resonant frequencies of the kingdom of God. 
And the prison that was themselves became a womb that belongs to God. And from that birth, they gave birth to the body of Christ in Europe, which most likely includes you. That had been God's strategy all along. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They weren't singing hymns about God to the prisoners. They were singing hymns to God, and lo and behold, the prisoners happened to be listening. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations, there's a deeper foundation than this foundation, the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do you suppose he meant by that? Saved from what? He wouldn't have meant what most Americans mean when they use the word hell. In fact, there is no word in the book of Acts that in any reputable translation gets translated with the English word hell. He, the jailer, might have meant Hades, which in Hebrews is translated as Sheol. The Hebrews believed that everyone went there. But clearly, if he was about to kill himself, the jailer was less afraid of Hades than he was of his Roman authorities, the men he was accountable to, and less afraid of Hades than his own shame. Paul never talks about being saved from hell. He does talk about being saved from sin. The sin. And that's the rub. <laughs> Most people really like the sin. Their sins. He also wrote about being delivered from this body of sin and death, what, what the Bible calls the flesh. The problem with the flesh is not that it's physical. I have to keep saying this over and over again. The problem with the flesh is that it's alone. Like an isolation cell in the depths of a prison. Uh, that's the biblical definition of death and destruction. Apoleia. Lostness, being alone. And don't you suppose that this jailer had become terrified of his sins or his sin? The promotion to jailer had been attractive at first, I'm sure, but he must have been haunted by the screams of those that he had tortured and then realized were men just like himself or actually were himself. He was torturing himself. Verse 30, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe means trust. Trust in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before him, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had trusted in God. The jailer was saved from the prison that was himself. And that's what baptism is. Not just a sign, but the substance. It's the revelation that you die with Jesus and you rise with Jesus. It's washing away the prison that is the old man and then releasing, giving birth to the new man. And, and, and then this is the scene that I would have just loved most to see. The jailer wakes up his whole household which apparently includes the prisoners that have been listening and chose not to run away once the prison doors flew open, right? There's a whole other story there. And then in the wee hours of the morning, they all go down to the river, and the jailer washes their wounds. He washes the wounds of Paul and Silas and maybe even all the other prisoners, and then Paul and Silas, well, they wash the jailer with the waters of baptism. And then as the sun is rising, they all go to the jailer's house and they have communion. They have a party at the jailer's dinner table. Verse 34, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had trusted, that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying the magistrates, he's still at his house, right? And, and the magistrates, uh, the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, 
They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, the church, they encouraged them and departed. And that's how the gospel invaded Europe and conquers all things. Jesus is our vision, and worship is our strategy. That's what it says in our information packet, and what I sometimes tell people when they ask about strategy, which is frustrating, I know. Jesus is our vision, and worship is our strategy. When I shared that uh, with Brett the first time, he said, worship isn't a strategy. And in the deepest sense, he is correct. A strategy is a plan for how you intend to get to a particular destination. But worship is the destination. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them saying to him who sits on the throne and under the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Every creature. The kingdom of heaven is every creature, all creation worshiping. So when Paul and Silas began to worship, their lives began to resonate with the rock-solid reality that is the new creation, and it obliterated the desecration that is the kingdom of the principalities and powers of this present age. Worship is not a strategy, and it's not your strategy. Susan gave up on trying to have babies. She gave up on her strategy to get pregnant and got pregnant. But if you try to not try, you're trying. And that's a strategy, which just convinces that you, you, that, that you can make babies, which traps you deeper in the prison that is yourself. To lose yourself, you have to focus on something greater than yourself. Paul worshipped God, and the prison crumbled. And they gave birth to all the disciples in Europe. But we can't end this sermon without noticing that Paul spent an awful lot of time in prison (laughs) after he was released from prison in Philippi. In fact, his letter to the Philippians is written from prison, most likely prison in Rome. Rejoice in the Lord always. And you can't tell me that in all those years in prison, It didn't occur to Paul to sing some hymns and praise songs, spiritual songs, to to, to worship. You can bet he sang and he worshiped, but there was no earthquake. And the prison doors didn't uh, miraculously open, and yet Paul did bear fruit. Most of it he did not see in his lifetime. In fact, in 2 Timothy, he almost seems to conclude that his ministry had been a a failure. He writes to Timothy, all have deserted me, and yet in prison he didn't know it at the time, but he wrote the Bible. (laughs) And so because of prison, you're sitting here this morning or you're listening online. Worship is not a strategy, and worship is not your strategy your way to manipulate God, and yet in a sense it is God's strategy. You worshiping is his vision, his strategy, and his goal. It's how eternity conquers temporality. It's how the kingdom comes. It's what Jesus said his father is looking for, worshipers. I had a strategy for a reformation. I had the platform, the publishers, the agents, the organizational structure, the money, the workers. It was called Lookout Mountain Community Church. And all I had to do to keep it was to publicly confess that God didn't want to save some. (laughs) And God couldn't save some. In other words, that for some, God is not salvation. When God called Paul, he said to Ananias, I will show him what he must suffer from my name. Jesus means God is salvation. 
And God wasn't punishing Paul. He was fixing to reveal his glory to Paul. In prison cells, shipwrecks, beatings, sleepless nights, persecution, and rejection. When we started this sanctuary 15 years ago, several people had prophetic words, and many of them coincided, and here are a few. Number one, the sanctuary is something God is doing. Number two, for a time it is to be only about worship. At first, I thought that meant that we were just supposed to sing a whole lot, and so we had extended singing after the service and everything, but didn't seem to go anywhere. You see, worship is so much more than singing. It's focusing on our vision, exalting our vision, who is Jesus. Every sermon must be worship, or it's worthless. Number three, this is a word that I received. Don't stop preaching my word. Eat the scroll, say what I tell you to say, whether or not anyone listens. Number four, and this I heard several times from more than one person, it will get smaller before it gets bigger. I'm so grateful for you <laughs> here and online because I think you're here to worship. For on the night he was betrayed by all of us. Betrayed because God's strategy is just so frickin' different than our strategies. Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant, the covenant. Hebrews calls it an eternal covenant, the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. So we invite you to come forward, tear off a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and then place it within you like a seed in broken and dirty soil. He's singing to us. Maybe we could sing to him. Be holy, holy. And so, Lord God, you reveal your glory in all that's true, in all that's right, in all that's beautiful. That's the light that shines in the darkness, that the truth that comes in the midst of the lies. That's the life that rises from death. And then, Lord God, your light, your life, your glory, your truth, your reason, you wrap in flesh. And you allow us to hang your heart on a tree. And lo and behold, that's to plant your heart within each one of us so that we would praise you and never, ever stop. You are good. And in Jesus' name we worship you. Amen.